Hi, my name is Jonathan, and I'm here to talk to you about likelihood fitting and dynamical models. My main goal for today is to start the process. We'll be doing this for three or four lectures, but to start the process of bringing together what we've been telling you about statistics and data with what we've been telling you about dynamical modeling. A key goal of MMED as a whole is to take the ideas for dyna from dynamical modeling and bring them closer to data and see use statistics to see what the data can tell us about the dynamic process of the spread of infectious disease. So in our modeling track, we've talked about different kinds of process models. What happens to individuals after they become infected? How do this infectious individuals loop back to create more infections? And we run these models with parameters. For example, what's the contact rate between <coughs> different individuals in our population, or how long do individuals remain sick, or how susceptible are individuals in different categories to different kinds of disease? And a key question when we're bridging statistics and dynamics is where do these parameter values come from? In many cases, these parameter values may come from the literature or from long experience with disease. Um, so Brian and John, when they were fitting to AIDS data from Harari, were able to make use of a lot of information about distributions of survival times with HIV. Here's an example from a more complicated model of a really excellent set of people being followed and how long do you survive after an HIV infection in different age groups. So we call that a priori parameterization. I have some data that I want to look at or compare to a model and I can get the parameters from somewhere else. Um, and once I have these estimates, I can put them into my models. I'm pretty comfortable that it's known about how long people survived with HIV in the pre antiretroviral therapy era. Sometimes you can't do a priori parameterization. Sometimes you don't have good enough information about some parameters. Sometimes the parameters from another place you might not think apply to your question or your place and time. And so the other way to fit models to data is to use the data of the time series that we're trying to fit. And so if we're literally trying to match every point in a data set, that's often called trajectory matching. The trajectory is the course of our dynamical system through time. So what do we think was the prevalence of HIV in each year in Harari? What are the reported number of HIV deaths each year in Harari? That would be a trajectory. There are broader approaches. If you have a lot of data, it may not be practical to try to match, for example, hundreds or thousands of data points of dengue incidents from different provinces in Thailand over decades. And so we may instead try to match broader patterns. What's the coefficient of variation? What's the ratio of dengue between coastal provinces and inland provinces? So that would be feature matching. So we have some parameters. Some of them may be fixed from outside, and some of them we might, might want to match to a data series that we have, either by using trajectory matching or feature matching. In this case, we're going to imagine that we have a single time series that we want to match, and that's going to correspond to what we've done in our Harari experiments over the last couple of days. Um, so what we want is a time series from our model that we can compare to our data. Um, and we can get that depending on our modeling approach, whether we have a deterministic model or a stochastic model, we may have a single number that we might want to treat as an expected value, or we might want to treat it as the truth and imagine that our observed value is simply a result of our modeled truth and observation error. Or we might have a stochastic model. We might need to use more complicated filtering methods to try to match the outcome of our model, which may differ every time we run it, with the real data. 
In either case, though, we need a statistical engine that's going to allow us to link what our model is telling us to what our data tells us. And that's where likelihood comes in. Likelihood is a tool for making inferences about parameters by comparing different values of parameters to each other. So for example, in 1998 in Harare, <coughs> uh, the data that John and Brian got showed a certain prevalence of HIV across anti antenatal clinics. And there are different ways to try to make sense of the amount of uncertainty in this point. We could ask, are these women, pregnant women showing up at antenatal clinics, a good representation of the overall population of women? That's an important question. We could ask, are the antenatal clinics we sample representative of the overall population of pregnant women in Harare? We could ask, do we expect to see correlations at different levels? For the sake of simplicity, for now, we're simplifying over all of these possible complexities. And I'm going to argue that it's often good to simplify, and that it's almost always good when you're simplifying to make note of the things we're simplifying over. So, so how do we bring our dynamical model together with data? Jim and or Steve has talked to you about maximum likelihood. We can take an observed data point, like the prevalence of HIV in antenatal clinics in Harare, and we can ask, how likely is it for different values of parameters? This is not an ideal way to evaluate parameters. It's certainly not the only way to evaluate parameters. What it is, is it's a very efficient and flexible way. If we're able to do statistics based on likelihood, we're able to evaluate not just a linear model or a log linear model or a generalized linear model. We're able to take whatever kind of dynamical model we want to use and bring it together with the data. Um, we may get more into details of the technicalities, but I just want to underline that's the reason that likelihood approaches, including maximum likelihood, are so powerful and popular is that they're flexible and efficient. They allow us to bring the data together with the model. Um, and what we need typically is an idea of a dynamical model. How is the disease behaving? And also an observation model. Given the idea that our model and our parameters are telling us the disease is behaving in a certain way, what is the probability of observing the data we observe? So the observation model we're using for now is a very simple one. It's a binomial model. It imagines that these 3,100 women observed in Harare in a given year are representative of the overall population of sexually active women in Harare. Um, and that within the context of that population, they're independent samples. And those of you who have studied statistics, can easily think of reasons to object to these simple assumptions. And we could in fact make a more complicated observation model that might take into account the fact that maybe women who go to a particular clinic have something in common. Maybe women who are pregnant differ, symptomatic, differ systematically from women who aren't pregnant. Um, and so we might in practice wanna use a more complicated likelihood than this. But in general, if we have a dynamical model and an observation model, we can calculate the probability of observing this point given our assumptions, our assumptions about the dynamics and our assumptions about the observation process. And then as Jim explained, we can turn that around and we can say, well, we have the data, relatively speaking, how likely is a particular set of parameters compared to another set of parameters? If we just had this one point, the likelihood method would be clunky 
and probably not our best possible choice. The big advantage of the likelihood method is that we can do it almost as easily for all of these points as we can just for the one point. So we can run a dynamical model. We produce a trajectory of hypothesized true values, and we can I evaluate the parameters of the model, and in some case, the model of itself by comparing the likelihoods. So in sum, what we want are parameters that we can put into a process model and ask what we think is going on in a particular system at this at a particular time. And the likelihood framework gives us a machine to do this. Now is a time when I would ordinarily pause for questions. And so if you have any questions now, this might be a time for you to pause and write them down. Or if you want to go get yourself a cup of tea, this might be a good time um, to get yourself a cup of tea. And now I'm going to step back a little bit and ask, well, now that we've maybe fit a model, now that we maybe have parameters and some uncertainties, now that we may be positioned to make forecasts of some time, why are we doing this? What are our goals when we fit models to data in infectious disease epidemiology? Very often, getting the fit or estimating the parameters becomes an end in itself. Um, there's a very influential epidemiologist, somebody who's been very important in building bridges between classical epidemiology and infectious disease epidemiology and dynamical epidemiology. And in addition to making a powerful argument decades ago that classical epidemiologists were getting important things about infectious disease wrong, um, Jim Koopman has been arguing that we beware of modeling for model's sake. And he's been working on constructing a framework where we use models as a tool to answer specific questions. Can we use the model to answer a specific question? And is our inference robust? In other words, should we trust our answer? So the first question, if we're working inside this framework, is what question are we asking? What specific actionable question are we asking whenever possible? And then he would argue we should start with very simple models, compare our simple models to the data and see what we learn, and basically do this over and over and over again. Um, and the guide to doing it over and over again is to ask, well, if I believe this model, what would I decide about policy? And once I know that, <clears throat> I'm going to ask, well, how robust does this inference seem? How much can I constrain the parameter space either with time series data or with exogenous data, things that we think are already known about this system? And we could ask, well, do I think I've made a robust inference? Do I think across this whole exploration, I'm getting the same answer? Or do I think I haven't made a robust inference? Do I think there's more I need to learn? If I've made a robust inference in this narrow world, then maybe it's time to broaden my world out a little bit. What are the most important things I've left out? Are things still going to be robust? If my inference isn't robust, then I definitely need to figure out what's missing, what would constrain things further. Can I get more data now? Do I need to be telling my policymakers that they need more data? Because maybe the kind of data I need to get further to go further along is not available yet. Um, and so this is a valuable way to ask, what am I doing with my model? What do I want to know? One of the things I like about this loop is that it never really ends, right? You can always be trying to do better. You can say, can I make my model more realistic? or can I gather more data? Um, we broke the two loops down into little pieces, um, but the main point is that they're both loops. As long as, the in, as long as I think my inference is robust, I can always be trying to be more realistic because my model 
is never going to be very realistic. Um, and as long as I don't think I have as, enough information for what I thought was my best guess for a simple model, I should be trying to get more information, trying to find other ways to constrain my parameter space with data. Um, so to summarize the framework, we're going to try to make a decision. We're going to try to figure out if we have enough information to make a decision. And to the extent that we do, we're going to try to keep pushing ourselves um, and getting more realistic. Um, we're going to pursue complexity that matters. Um, so if the model is covering enough details that I think the details that I've left out are unlikely to change the answer, then maybe it's time to say, well, I'm reasonably confident of the answer, but we're still never done, right? There's still always the possibility that we're going to learn more, for example, that a new coronavirus variant is circulating or understand something that we didn't before. But the key to this framework is to have an idea of what kind of decision you're trying to make and use models as a tool to explore that and hopefully eventually to validate it. It's not about proving that your method works. It's not about having a good model. It's not about parameters for their own sake. It's about using the model to answer practical questions. So to summarize, we want to bring models together with data and we want to do that with techniques that allow us to estimate model parameters and their uncertainty. Um, we want to keep comparing our models to the data to make sure our models are grounded in the real world. It's good to start with simple models and understand what they're doing and why and what they're missing. It's easy to get yourself in trouble if you jump straight to a complicated. Um, you can use your model to figure out what needs to be known, what's not known that we need to find out more about, and we can add complexity gradually. Thank you for your attention.